Uh, my name is Peter Bartlett. I'm the Associate Director here. Um, very happy to have you here for the uh, first workshop in the Causality Program, uh, the workshop on learning and interventions. Um, uh, first of all, a big thank you to the organizers for, for this workshop. Uh, Caroline Uller and Bin Yu, thanks very much for all your work. Um, so it's a, going to be a very exciting week. We're very uh, happy to have the lineup that we have. Um, uh, enthusiastic to see uh, all the work that's going on in the in the causality program this semester. It's a it's a big and energetic program. Brought uh, more than eighty people to uh, to Berkeley. Um, uh, I'm going to hand over to um, Bin and uh, Caroline in just just a moment. I want to say a few words about logistics for uh, for the week. Uh, so we need to keep masks on indoors, um, uh, as you all know. Um, uh, also, food and drink, um, we'll leave it outside. Uh, that's going to be during the breaks. You're on your own at lunch. Uh, please don't bring uh, drinks or food into the, into the uh, auditorium. Um, uh, we do at lunchtime, you can, you can leave things in lockers on the far side of the building. Uh, there are lockers with pin codes there. Um, also, we have everything being streamed uh, over Zoom and over YouTube and uh, Omid Farr, our videographer here, is going to be helping speakers um, uh, hook up and, and microphones and so on, um, uh, helping them with microphones and hooking up computers. Um, okay, so uh, and enjoy the week. I'll hand over to uh, the two of them. Well, welcome to the workshop. We're very excited to have really a great program covering learning from interventions from theory to practice. And uh, this morning, I guess Caroline will be chairing and we're gonna keep uh, talks to 30 minutes. So, um, and then we have a panel and then you will see how Caroline will moderate the panel. And we just invite everyone to join and the speakers ask each other questions. And very excited to meet many of you whom I haven't met and see old friends. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, welcome also from my end. I'm really excited to see so many people and others also joining online. Um, we're really excited about this uh, workshop where we've tried to go very broad also in terms of, you know, the different types of applications um, where interventional data is becoming more abundant, um, all the way from education to psychology to economics uh, to biology, etc. So hopefully we'll be actually spanning the whole, um, a lot of uh, the different applications. And in addition, of course, also having um, talks by uh, researchers who have worked a lot on, on the foundations of how to actually model and and, and take into account interventional data together with observational data in order to get at causality. And so that's how we're going to start the morning. Um, so our first speaker is going to be Frederick Eberhardt, um, who is a professor in philosophy um, at Caltech. And uh, he has a really exciting title up uh, that I'm really excited to hear. And then afterwards, we'll have uh, three more talks. So one more before the break. All of them will be online. And how we want to do this, as Ben just said, is we'll have 30 minutes talks and we'll keep, I mean, of course, questions that are of clarifying nature, please go ahead. But all of the bigger questions, uh, let's keep them for the panel discussion, which we have after every block. So after the morning block, we'll have today a, a panel discussion from 12 to 12.30. Then again, in the afternoon, we'll have a panel discussion at the end, where hopefully we'll have a lot of discussion so that we can find a bit more unifying th themes across the different talks and have questions that relate to maybe different talks or also single talks, but just so that there is a bit more of a discussion across the different themes. So with that, let's get started. So Frederick, um, please, thank and you. thank you. And do I need to turn this off or? Thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, uh, I don't know what you're in for on a your gray Valentine's Day starting it with me, so uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, uh, the title is uh, uh, a twist on uh, a paper by Eric Hole, which I'm going to be discussing in some detail um, and uh, uh, look at it in uh, at some of the parts where I don't think it quite works out. So here we go. I'm interested in causal macro variables, so in particular in high level abstractions that we think we can construct of low level systems. So for example, we often think of El Nino as a causal level, as a 
uh, climate macro phenomenon. We talk about it as affecting the, uh, the rainfall in California, as uh, affecting the droughts in uh, Australia and Southeast Asia. And it's a climate phenomenon that is described largely in terms of this tongue of hot water that extends from the west coast of the Americas all the way across the Pacific. And it's supposed to have an effect different from the opposite, La Nina, which is, this cold, uh, which is this tongue of cold water extending from the west coast of the Americas into the uh, Pacific. And the thought is that we can talk about El Nino and La Nina as causes or effects of even the world economy, in that case as causes, uh, at a, such a high level, even though we think they are constituted or uh, uh, supervene on the low level phenomena of what's going on in the equatorial Pacific. So my question in general is not about El Nino or La Nina specifically, but under what circumstances are we licensed and what is needed to be able to talk about causal relations at such a high and abstract level? So in particular, if we look at wind maps over the equatorial Pacific and sea surface temperature maps uh, in the same region, then I want to know under what circumstances is something like the high level abstract causal relation that I've drawn their license, namely that something like westerly equatorial winds are the cause of El Nino, and that subsequently El, the phenomenon of El Nino is a cause of rainfall and subsequently economic impacts in the US or in, in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, of course, this sort of multi-level description of causal relations is not restricted somehow to climate science. We find it as an old problem in mental causation in philosophy, where we're interested in um, how mental states, how our thoughts, beliefs, desires relate to the underlying brain states. I think uh, many of us believe that mental states are constituted by the brain states uh, um, that instantiate them, and that mental states might be able to cause each other. So my belief in something might cause me to develop an intention to do something else and ultimately lead to behavior and that I'm licensed to talk in that way, even though what all that belief and desire and intention and thought is actually instantiated in is at a low level in, the, in terms of a particular brain state. So the question is why and under what circumstances can we abstract to such a psychological level independent of the neuroscience that underlies it? Okay, so in all these cases, the idea is that there is a causal relation that we want to describe that is distinct from the constitutive relation the brain doesn't cause the mental state. The mental state is constituted by uh, a particular brain state. But maybe we want to say that the brain state can cause subsequent brain states, but at the same time that we can talk at the higher vertical level, uh, I will take, keep this distinction throughout the talk that the constitutive relations are on the vertical axis, that the mental state can still be said to cause a subsequent mental state. So I'm interested in theories that build this sort that take into account this sort of multi-level causal analysis and that look at what sort of uh, criteria are necessary to talk at an abstract level about a very fine-grained uh, low-level system. Okay, so to get started a little bit more formally, the idea is we have some high-dimensional low-level states I and J that influence each other. We can intervene on them. And what we want to construct is some lower dimensional abstraction in terms of C and E, where we still want to be able to talk causally about that abstraction in the sense, and by talking causally about that abstraction, what I mean is that we can make sense of saying, I'm intervening on C, and I can talk about the effect of an intervention on C, while I full well acknowledge that C is instantiated or constituted by the underlying I and E is constituted by the underlying J, okay? So in particular, the, the functions that are vertical are not causal ones, whereas the functions that are horizontal are causal relations. So if you look around for theories like this, then uh, one of the theories that you'll come across is uh, one in a paper developed by Eric Hole, which is uh, the uh, title is there, when the map is better than the territory in which my title for this talk derives from, where he is one of the few people who gives a very precise account of how to piece together a low level micro level system of interactions for which we then can describe in very precise terms the circumstances under which then abstraction to a um, macro level is permitted. So I want to talk, I want to explain what this theory is, and then I want to take a look at how exactly uh, it works or where it perhaps doesn't work. Okay, so he starts with a finite state space, a large finite state space at the micro level, and it turns out he has. So the causal relations, he's looking at one system 
over time, well, you can think of it as over time that he has as for the I and J, the same finite state space. We can argue about that later, whether that was a good idea or not, but that's the setup that he has. And then he describes the system's causal relations at the micro level in terms of the standard transition probability matrix. You can think of this matrix as just describing the probability of each state J coming about given the particular state I. Since we're not talking about confounding here at all, um, uh, you can also think of these probabilities as just the interventional probabilities. If you manipulate I to a particular micro level value, what is the probability that you get a specific value of J? There is no, uh, so there are various ways of interpreting this sort of system. You can think of it as looking at the system at two different time points. So I is the system at time point one and J is the system at time point two. You, but you needn't think of it as a time series. In particular, there's no commitment to this time series uh, uh, equilibrating or being stationary or anything like that. Um, but you can also just think of this uh, transition probability matrix as the input output relation of the system. Okay, so uh, th there are various ways of um, interpreting it. So, of course, any sort of coarsening of the state space of I and subsequently of J is a sort of abstraction of this model. But in order to say that we actually have a macro level causal model, I don't think any sort of abstraction counts. And Eric Ho, in his account, says that. What really matters to having an appropriate abstraction is that we maximize effective information. That is, he says, we have a fine-grained micro-level system, and we can describe that at the course level by maximizing effective information. Okay, so the obvious question is, what is effective information? Information, uh, effective information is described in somewhat peculiar terms. It's not, not uh, uh, specific to whole. It was developed by others before. Um, where the thought is that you have an input intervention distribution, which is the uh, maximum entropy distribution on the cause. So you intervene on the cause with a maximum entropy distribution, which in this case, given a sort of simplistic system, is just, of course, a uniform distribution over the states. And the effect distribution is just the uh, distribution over the effect, namely J in this case, that results from this maximum entropy distribution over the cost, right? So the, the distribution is given by the transition probability matrix and you just take the averages over the transition probability matrix. Nothing particularly exciting happening here yet. So what effective information is supposed to look at is it's supposed to uh, give you a sense of how much control the cause has over the effect. And so the crucial part in um, establishing effective information is to look at how much does a the distribution resulting from a specific intervention, when I set the micro level i to little i, how much does that diverge from the general average effect distribution when I put in a maximum entropy distribution uh, into the cause? Okay, how do we measure distances between distributions? Well, one way is to do it with the KL divergence, and that's exactly what effective information does. So it's an average over the KL divergences that we have between the individual uh, intervention on one particular state and the average intervention that we get when we take the maximum entropy over uh, these states. So if you look now at effective information being defined in this way, then obviously you will recognize the information theoretic quantities that are there. Namely, it's just here the mutual information between the cause and the effect when you put in uh, um, a maximum entropy distribution in the cause, and when you look at what the effect is, that results. So the thought is that effective information gives us a notion of the type of causal control that we have from the cause to the effect, um, and it connects these sorts of causal, this causal control to information theoretic notions, namely that of mutual information. Okay, that's all very nice. Um, I think there are a couple of other reasons why, why there is this focus on effective information. It's supposed to uh, provide a sort of directed notion of information um, since it's defined in terms of the interventional distribution on, uh, on the cause. And it's also, as I suggested, with the connection between causal control and, and mutual information, uh, it's supposed to develop this sort of bridge between causal notions and informatic notions. Why does, why does it use the maximum entropy distribution as the input uh, um, cause? Uh, why does it use the maximum uh, entropy distribution over the cause as the input? Well, because I think there's not much discussion and whole, the motivation is that you want to explore the full state space of the cause to get a sense 
of what you can really do with this sort of cause, rather than focusing merely on specific states that uh, might occur naturally in nature. You would only see a subset of possibly what you could be doing with the cosmic clarification. Does this definition require them to be defined on the cosmic At all. Uh, so no, the, the maximum entropy distribution doesn't maximize this quantity. Uh, so uh, this is just purely defined in terms of I put in the maximum entropy distribution and look what the effect distribution is. And that's I measure the mutual information between the two. Yeah. It, it doesn't. So there might well be a different distribution over the cause that would be uh, that would result in higher mutual information. So if you're asking if it maximizes mutual information, that's not the case, or not necessarily the case, let's put it that way. OK, uh, great. Uh, these are questions that indicate that you're exactly where I want you to be in terms of the thinking. Great. So what's the thought then? The thought is then, as you might expect it given the last question, is that, look, we have causal emergence when we maximize effective information. That is, we want to look at the system at the micro level and then say, look, what sort of effective information is there between cause and effect? And can we maximize that in effective information? Well, can we maximize that when we change the state space of, let me see whether this works. This will probably not be visible on Zoom, but, but you can see it. So if you change the state space of uh, the input I, of the cause I, can we maximize the effective information between uh, I and J? That's exactly the thought. And so then causal emergence occurs just in case you can find a coarsening of I such that uh, you maximize effective information, okay? Well, that just the way I said it, it's not well defined yet because of course, if I want to compute effective information, I have to be able to uh, make sense of the intervention distributions on the cause. So in, in specifically what I haven't told you yet is how do we make sense of an intervention on the macro level C and by setting it to C, what does that, to little c, what does that correspond to at the micro level? Okay, in general, one can ask oneself is that, okay, what, when I set the temperature in the room to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, what does that correspond to at the micro level? There are various ways that one can think about it. What Hall does uh, is to say that I'm going to just take the average of the interventions at the micro level that correspond to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? So an intervention on the macro level is just the average of the interventions that correspond to that value at the macro level, at the, uh, at the micro level, okay? So I've written this somewhat uh, uh, in, in a notation that is not actually uh, completely legitimate because I'm writing that uh, the intervention on C is just the sum of the interventions on, on I that correspond to that C. Of course, a do operator cannot be the, uh, the subject of a sum just like that. But you know, I hope intuitively, at least, uh, the, if I wrote out the full formula, it's much more complicated to read. But C has to be a smaller space than I? Yes, that's the idea. Yeah, so, so sorry, I, that's what I meant to say here. When we maximize effective information, then we're looking over the course means over the state space of I. By course mean, I mean, uh, as, um, yes, the smaller states. So you, you merge states. Do yeah. you assume you know the size or you also maximize that? Do I assume I know the size of what? Of C. Of C. No, that's what I'm searching. So I'm so the way to think of it is I'm searching over all possible course names. So in the never mind how we do it computationally more efficiently. But so conceptually the idea is that uh, I search over all possible course names of I and look whether any of those uh, maximize effective information. And if any of the course means maximize effective information, so thereby I have a variable C that has a smaller state space than I, in that case, I have co uh, 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 causal emergence, right? So causal emergence is not something that necessarily occurs. It's something that only will occur if I can maximize in effective information by course. Yeah, okay, great. Um, okay, uh, um, so. The, the overall picture then is the following, is that I'm, I'm going to have a micro level system. I have causal emergence just in case I take, when I have any sort of coarsening of the micro level cause, 
I take a maximum entropy distribution over that coarsening. I take the mapping from that intervention distribution on the macro level to the micro level by just taking averages over the interventions on the micro level. And if this sort of coarser description maximizes effective information, then I have causal emergence. Okay, that's the thought. So the first thing to notice, just as I said before, causal emergence doesn't occur for every system. Some systems might be might maximize effective information at the finest granularity. That's kind of that's that's certainly possible. The other thing is, uh, to notice is that I'm putting in a maximum entropy distribution at the coarse level. Of course, that needn't ma map to a maximum entropy distribution at the micro level as, uh, either. Okay, so if this is the setup, uh, then notice that, of course, this goes back to the question that was there earlier about um, whether this maximizes mutual information. It's, uh, it's close to maximizing mutual information. So notice if you maximize, if you, if you think of uh, maximizing mutual information by looking over the possible distributions over I, then um, uh, there is a close connection because effective information is a sort of mutual information that the maximization here is over course means of I, not over distributions over the micro level I. Right? But if it were this sort of maximization, then we would, of course, be talking about channel capacity. Right? So no surprise then that Eric Hole calls this sort of notion the causal capacity. But this sort of approximate sign is of the formal nature of hand waving at best. There is no sort of proof that says that this approximation is tight or in any sort of form. Uh, necessarily close. So notice in particular that the maximization of effective information is restricted, namely you only look at a subset of possible intervention distributions, namely those that are maximum entropy at the course level. Whereas if you maximize, if, you, if you're looking for channel capacity, then you maximize over all possible distributions of the sender in this case. On the other side, Ident uh, uh, Eric Hole requires that there are identical state spaces for I and J for the input and output. And of course, if we look at the, the channel capacity between sender and receiver, there's no such requirement that we change the state space of the receiver, right? We're just searching over different distributions over the sender, right? So that's why I'm saying that while, while Eric Hole gives a whole bunch of examples where indeed um, channel, uh, sorry, um, causal capacity approximates uh, channel capacity, this sort of approximation is rather loose. Okay, so just to give you an example of what this sort of uh, 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 technique gives you, here's an example of a very simple uh, um, transition probability matrix between eight states in the uh, uh, cause and eight states in the effect. And of course, if you look at this, then you will see the first seven states are doing the same thing, uh, have the same effect. And so unsurprisingly, if you maximize um, uh, effective information, then you end up with C having just two states and E having two states and a, a state transition matrix that is just like this, um, uh, where you collapse the first seven states. None of this should be particularly surprising. That's what we would expect. That's that, that an abstraction of this sort of system should uh, just collapse the first seven states because what's the point in distinguishing the first seven states? They're doing the same thing. Okay. The more interesting case, I think, is something like this. Right now, it's not going to be obvious to you, uh, I think, um, is that, in fact, if you maximize effective information here, then indeed you end up with the same uh, transition probability matrix at the abstract level at the coarse grain system. And now notice that, of course, there are a whole bunch of very different states being collapsed together. Again, the first seven states are being collapsed together, but notice that state one and state four have very different effects, for example, on states, uh, what's that, six and seven. So in particular, state one doesn't put any weight on state six and seven, whereas state four puts about almost half its weight on state six and seven. Yet these two states are going to be collapsed into one and the same macro state. Okay, question? Sorry, uh, I have a basic question. So what prevents just a trivial coarsening where, I mean... Ah, because that would not maximize effective information. Effective information would go to zero if you just coarsen everything together. No, no, I mean keep everything separate. In, in this case, yeah, yeah. because it doesn't, uh, because if you do coarsen, then effective information is higher, which I think might give you some sense that, of course, effective information is maximized with the uh, with the transition probability matrix like this, right, which is diagonal with ones, right, and uh, so if you kept it like this, the effective information is just much lower. That's the reason. Uh, I, I didn't, I, I should have perhaps included the numbers, but it's, uh, yeah. 
So can we think of the, the coarsening CI as just the partitions of I? Yeah. Just look at yeah, that's, that's just exactly what it is. Given that we've just got the finite skisses, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, I should have, sorry, I meant to be that's explicit about that. Okay, so, so what bothers me about this sort of thing? So state one and state four are collapsed into the same state, macro state, but uh, they seem to me at least to have quite different causal effects. So my example for this sort of thing comes from uh, a paper by Peter Spertes and Richard Shinas on uh, uh, ambiguous manipulations. And the thought is that, look, if I have total cholesterol as a macro variable, and that is a cause of heart disease, but total cholesterol is actually constituted by happy lipids and lousy lipids, yes? Uh, and happy lipids have a positive effect on heart disease and lousy lipids have a negative effect on heart disease. Excuse my, my medicine by, to all the medical professionals in here. So this has nothing to do with real medicine. So um, then uh, uh, what I would say about this is that, look, if you intervene now on total cholesterol, the effect of total cholesterol is ambiguous because it depends on the mixture of HDL versus LDL on what the effect on heart disease is. Of course, I can fix the effect on heart disease by fixing the distribution of HDL versus LDL by say a maximum entropy distribution, I could do that. But that just means that I'm arbitrarily fixing what my macro level description is by the, the, the intervention distribution that I'm putting in on the cost. So I think these sorts of things where you collapse two different sorts of causes that have very different effects into one variable and thereby create these sorts of ambiguous manipulations is something that you don't want to have in your construction or you want to very, be very careful about in your construction of macro variables. So then the obvious, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, I missed this. This is probably, you said it, but how is the state, size of the state space C of I determined? I mean, how many uh, elements in the coarsening? So you go through of, of the C. Okay, so you start with a finite state space in I and you search over all possible coarsenings of uh, I. And so the state space in C will obviously be finite, but at most as large as I. And then you look for that state space that maximizes effective information and that fixes the state the, the size of the state space in C. Okay, so, so it is over, it's not that that's predetermined. So you could have any size state space you want. That, well, up, up to the, up to up the, to the yeah, size up to of the, I. Yeah. yeah, okay, got it, that's thank right. you, sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, sorry, I should have been clear about that as well. So, um, so obviously for me, the question is like, okay, we've got this difference here, but how bad could this difference be? Right? How, how far apart can I push states such that they still get collapsed into the same macro state. Okay, so here's a simple example that, that we looked for. So notice that states one and two have quite different causal effects, I would suggest, um, but they still get collapsed into the same state space. Now, you might say, okay, look, they are quite different, but are they really that different? Both of them are more different to the third state that has been kept separate, right? But notice if I had changed 0.7 to 0.8 here, then, we wouldn't be collapsing these two anymore. So if you're thinking that, look, this, this third state is really different from the first two, um, then I'm with you. I can see that you might want to collapse under that sort of qualitative notion, the first two states. But wouldn't you also have that view then if I changed the first 0.7 to 0.8? It seems like that's not the difference. But if I change the first 0.7 to 0.8, I wouldn't collapse. I would stay at this uh, micro level state uh, uh, um, partition. So obviously, if I ask about how far can I push the effect of different states apart, then that depends on the distance metric that I'm using to separate how different two, the effects of two states are. In this case, I just maximize the absolute value between uh, 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 these, these probabilities here in the uh, uh, prob uh, transition probability matrix, but we also looked at a whole pile of other measures. In all cases, the upshot is that the boundary where suddenly the effect of information uh, collapses the two states seems firstly to occur at a point when these states are extremely different already, um, but then also just slightly more different and you don't collapse, it doesn't seem that that lines up with what we intuitively might think would be a point where we say that uh, we should be collapsing. Uh, but sorry, a bit, yeah. So just a question about the calculation. So the way you write it seems like the, the, the thing you're maximizing still is like on the three by three kind of top. 
Yes, yeah, so it's it's a it's a little bit tricky to write this because we're we're going to take apart a, a coarsening of I, and then we look at the effective information from that coarsening. So I could write C of I here if you if you, if that would help. The problem is if I write that, then I would have to write C of I here as well, and then my notation gets really messy because the state space between I and J has to be the same, right? So you're right. Is that to be completely precise? I should have written the coarsened version of i here and the coarsened version of j here and that's what we're looking for the effective information yeah okay i was debating about changing that notation but thought this would be simpler obviously that didn't work so uh, sorry about that um okay so that was my first point so my first concern is that we, we we have very separate causal effects in this sort of system that are collapsed at a point that seems absolutely arbitrary um okay i want to talk about a different uh, thing very quickly do i still have a few minutes Give me a few extra, please. Um, so uh, um, normally, when we talk about causal models, we're perfectly happy to think about marginalization. And we look at, OK, if we have a micro level causal model like this, we're not troubled by saying that, look, this long arrow that I drew there actually is secretly representing that there are other mediators that are along the way. OK, so there could have been an I prime there somewhere along the way. We just didn't represent it. Right. So we marginalized it up. So maybe then you should think that, look, we should also be able to think of, uh, uh, of the system that way at the macro level as well, that the arrows that we draw at the macro level also might contain mediators. But if that's your view, I think that's the view you ought to have. Um, then, um, and that's, I think, actually the view that most of us have implicitly who work with causal models anyway then I think abstraction and marginalization should commute. That is to say, if I first were to marginalize out the middle variable here and then abstract just the relation between I and J, then I should get the same thing as if I abstract the relationship between I and I prime and the relationship between I prime and J. And then when I've got my system up here, I marginalize out C prime, okay? So to me, it, should, it seems like marginalization and abstraction should commute because we, we are implicitly marginalizing all the time when we draw our causal model. Well, as you might expect, this is not going to work in this sort of uh, case. And the, the reason is, of course, trivial, but I just want to point it out. So we just go through an example here. We've got transition probability matrices. I'm going to abstract the individual relations I to I prime first. I get this, this one. And since the transition probability matrix is exactly the same, I, do, I get the same abstract relationship here. If I now marginalize, that's the uh, transition probability matrix that I end up with. I have two states at the macro level. OK, now we do it the other way around. I first uh, marginalize the bottom one, which means I just take the square of the transition probability matrix. That's this. If I, mar if I try to maximize effective information now, turns out it's already maximized at the micro level. Okay. So there is no effective information is already uh, uh, maximized. There's no further abstraction that happens. So obviously these two are not the same. So marginalization and uh, abstraction don't commute. I think that's a problem. I think that really undermines your kind of model because it suggests that the kind of representation that you, or the kind of abstraction that you're getting is extraordinarily sensitive in how you pick your variables along the way. Obviously the problem, the source of the problem here is that for the marginalize, sorry, for the abstraction, you're always introducing these sorts of maximum entropy distributions into the system. So when I when I construct the abstraction of the I prime to J relation, I'm putting in a maximum entropy distribution here on the I prime. But of course, that maximum entropy distribution will not look like the effect that I'm getting from the first uh, variable. So when I marginalize, I'm getting something very different from. Um, uh, from the uh, then when I abstract first, it's not. It's this is this is really a trivial point once you see how the model is working, uh, but it really I think screws up this sort of setup. So last two slides, I'm I'm, I'm there with you. Hang on. So a couple of general points. I think it is worth distinguishing between macro level causes or causal representations, as it's sometimes discussed now as well, and mixtures of causal effects. I think they are two different things. They, uh, there, there are such things where we have mixtures of effects and there are things where we want to talk about the macro level representation as causal in its own right, okay? So when I take off my sweater because the temperature is at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a different story than some sort of mixture of uh, uh, the causal effects of the macro level representation. It's, it's, I'm sensitive to the macro level cause. Okay, the second point is 
What got screwed up, I think, in Hull's account is that um, there was an introduction of, of these uh, intervention probabilities, namely the maximum entropy distribution. And instead, I think when we talk about macro level causes, what we should be sensitive to is just the conditional probability distribution or the interventional uh, 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 conditional probability distribution of the effect given an intervention on the cause. This sort of conditional is the relevant thing to look at when we look at abstractions. We should not worry about what the intervention distribution is over the cause. And I think that's where things go wrong in several accounts, actually. But if, if you do that, then you'd also don't run into this problem with the commutation of abstraction and marginalization. I've not discussed this here, but I'm happy to talk about it. Um, I think uh, there's a very crucial difference between asking what the macro level causes and what the macro level effect is. We need to distinguish those two questions and address them separately. And this sort of account that I just presented by fixing the state space of the effect to be the same as the cause uh, arbitrarily picks a coarsening of the effect that I don't think has any independent justification. That should not be the way to go. Specifically about Hull's account, I think the relation between information theory and uh, causality via this notion of effective information is tenuous or suggestive at best. Um, I, I don't think it is, is as close as he's suggesting. I think that would be, it would be nice to have that sort of connection to information theory, but this is not it. Um, channel capacity in the information theoretic sense is a normative concept. That means whether or not the channel capacity is exhausted is an empirical question. Whether your sender is actually any good at sending their messages is an empirical question. So similarly, the causal emergence here that uh, uh, is defined by Eric Hull's account is a notion of possible emergence, not of actual emergence. It may not ever be exhibited by the system in question. And finally, effective information, when you maximize it, it is always unique, but it is not clear that the implied partition over the, 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 the value of effective information is always unique when you maximize it, but it's not clear that the partition that maximizes effective information is unique. So there could be two different partitions that both maximize effective information, but they then would be very different causal abstractions. That would be somewhat peculiar. Now, I think this cuts both ways. Either you want a unique abstract model and you think there is a unique way of abstractly describing a system, then this is not going to work. Or you don't want it because you think there can be causal abstractions at multiple levels, right? There's quantum physics, there's physics, there's biology, there's economics. Right, um, And so then you might want causal stories at each of these levels, but then this sort of maximization of effective uh, information is not going to give you those different types of uh, um, uh, unique, uh, those different levels. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> We got some slack as the, as the main organizer of this whole program and all the work we've done for this. Great, so uh, we're moving on to the next talk, which will be given virtually. Um, so I'm looking for some guidance on what I have to do.